Today's presentation is on student access needs and disability resources for teaching and learning. Um, this webinar will provide a background on the range of disability needs and common accommodations for our students at SF State, and will create awareness of the services that support the faculty that teach them. SF State has distinguished itself as a leader in the area of accessibility since the founding of the Disability Programs and Resource Center in 1975. It wasn't originally called that, but that's been its name for about the last 20 years. That leadership has come in the form of a basic care for students of all needs and has established a sustainable support model providing services to around 2,500 students per year. I'll add that that leadership uh, extends across the system. Our campus has been at the forefront of uh, accessible services across instructional uh, materials, across IT purchasing and across websites, uh, more so than most other campuses. And uh, many of them have been striving to catch up uh, in the last many years as the issue has become uh, more important across the country and across our state. The team here to, is here today to walk you through the current state of disability needs on campus, new post-COVID trends in, this, in those student access needs, best practices for common accommodations, and an overview of faculty support resources. Nicole Redding, the director of DPRC, will be joined today by her DPRC colleagues, Roberta Santiago, associate director of DPRC, Daniel Fontaine, our longtime accessibility technology coordinator, and Maysoon Elgethi, lead advising and advocacy specialist. Additionally, we will provide time for questions at the end of their presentation. So throughout, feel free to use the Q&A section here in Zoom, and we will pull from those to feed our panelists questions at the end of the session. This panel is sponsored by the Academic Technology Advisory Committee, which brings together faculty, administrators, and IT providers to assess and plan for needs around technology as it is used in teaching, learning, and research. My name is Andrew Roderick, as I stated at the beginning, and um, I really hope you enjoy today's webinar. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to our DPRC team. Take it away, Nicole. All right. Uh, thanks so much for having us and inviting us to participate in this, Andrew and your team. First of all, we uh, look forward to any opportunity to get in front of folks to talk about the work that we do um, and also to answer uh, what I know will be some great questions at the end of our presentation today. So we'll make sure that we leave time for that um, as we keep moving along. Um, so Nicole Redding, the director of the DPRC, I use she, her pronouns um, I've been with San Francisco State since 2019. I just had my four-year anniversary in, in January, um, and I have been um, uh, acting as director um, as between interim and, and permanent uh, since uh, May of 2021. So I've um, uh, been at SF State for, for a few years. So um, let me just get started with our... Um, uh, slides. So Andrew already introduced the rest of um, our staff, the rest of my team that, that's here with us today. Um, so the four of us are part of a team of when we're fully staffed. Um, I think we've got 13 or 14 full-time staff um, on our team working um, in disability services to um, provide accommodations. Um, and just to give you an overview of what we'll talk about over the next 40 minutes or so, I'll go over our mission, uh, our mission statement and our purpose. Um, I'll give a summary of our different program areas. Um, I'll go over some DPRC student population statistics and trends. Um, and then I'll turn it over um, to Roberto, who will talk, walk us through some best practices for um, course accessibility. Um, and then Maysoon will share some student experiences. And then uh, finally, Dan will... Um, talk about accessible technology best practices, and then we'll wrap up and have some time for your questions. So the only way to get through our mission statement is to read it. So <laughs> I, I'm not a huge fan of reading off slides, but I'm going to do it here. Um, so the DPRC collaborates with SS State's diverse community to ensure that all aspects of campus life uh, which is learning, working, and living are universally accessible. The DPRC provides the university with resources, education, and direct services in order that people with disabilities have a greater opportunity to achieve social justice and equity. So what does that mean and what does that look like? So we provide reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities in accordance with a couple different um, federal laws and some uh, system-wide um, and university directives as well. The one that you're probably most familiar with is the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. 
um, that was also amended in 2008. Um, then the next uh, big one is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which I do not expect you to remember. <laughs> um, however, I do want to note, I put a, a plug in here for the, the documentary Crip Camp. If you haven't seen that on Netflix, I, I highly encourage it, um, not only because it um, uh, explains um, a lot of the history um, of the disability rights movement, um, but also a lot of that history took place right here in San Francisco. So we are unique in that way as well. So watch Crip Camp. It's on Netflix. I also think it's free on YouTube still. Um, and then, of course, um, CSU EO 1111, um, and in addition to a couple other um, executive orders and an HR directive for employee accommodations. And then in addition to that, it is the right thing to do um, to increase access and include people with disabilities in all aspects of campus life. So I'll quickly summarize our program areas. So the, the, the biggest um, area I would say is our advising and advocacy programs, so our student services. Um, as soon as our lead advising and advocacy specialists, so our lead disability specialists, um, and their role is to uh, uh, meet students, um, talk to them about their disability related needs and then determine um, appropriate accommodations and then help with disability management throughout um, their time here at SF State. And then uh, Dan's shop, accessible technology. So that's software, hardware training for um, all types of accessible technology and accessible media. Uh, it falls under that as well. Um, campus access services. So that's accessible events, physical access, deaf and hard of hearing services. Also our exam accommodation services, which is faculty you might be quite familiar with. Um, and then finally, uh, employee accommodations, which I won't get too, too much into today um, or I won't touch on today. Um, however, I just want to note that um, we are a little bit unique uh, from other CSUs and that employee accommodations are handled by a manager in our office within DPRC. Um, usually it's uh, managed under HR um, or just a different area of campus. So we're a little bit unique um, in that way. So just to share with you some numbers, so I'm going to go through these numbers and then I'm going to explain the limits of these numbers and why this data is um, uh, just, just really where we're limited with some of these numbers. And I'll explain that in a minute. So um, we currently, as of yesterday, uh, have 2,600 active students um, registered with, that, with us. So those are students that are currently eligible for accommodations, who have gone through our process, um, I'm not going to go too far into the details with the uh, the, the rest of the numbers here, um, but just note that psychological disabilities are over 900. That is a high number that re represents a huge portion of our population, um, and that's something that has been an ongoing trend and continues to be a trend coming out of COVID, right, an increase in things like anxiety, depression, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, right? Um, and then ADHD is, is next with 563 students. Um, learning disability follows closely behind that. And then as we get into lower numbers, mobility disability, blind low vision, um, acquired or traumatic brain injury, also referred to as ABI or TBI, uh, deaf and hard of hearing, and then our um, a, a large kind of bucket category for, for ones that don't quite fit into that um, is other. Um, I, I won't get too far into the details of, of that category, but just know that um, uh, disabilities that don't fall under these primary categories are sometimes categorized as other. And, and one of the things I want to point out um, as well is that everything that there is an asterisk next to is considered a hidden or invisible disability. Um, so that is just by looking at somebody, there is no vis visible or visual indicator that that person has a disability or is disabled. Um, and so that is over 80% of our population. And I think that's a pretty common misconception that I still encounter is that there are a lot of folks that think our services are just for folks with physical disabilities, mobility disabilities. I mean, that's just not the case. Um, and then finally, we have ha we had over a thousand student appointments um, last fall. So we are busy. Uh, we are on track, I think, to at least meet, if not break that <laughs> um, this semester. And then just to quickly um, go over some of the details of um, our, uh, why our, our data is limited here. So 2,600 is about 10% of our student population. Uh, we know that that is not representative of the number of students with disabilities on our campus for a couple different reasons. Um, one of those reasons is that the CDC says that about one in, in four or about 25% of the population is living with at least one disability. 
And then, um, so of course, like sitting around 10%, where we're lower than that 25% that we might expect um, out of the general population. And then the second is just through anecdotes that we have students that come to us our senior year, come to us in grad school for the first time. And they're like, hey, I didn't know that the service existed. I've had a disability my whole life, or I received disability services in high school, whatever the story is, or whatever the narrative is. And then they come to our doors and say, hey, I need help. And I'm so glad you're here to provide support services. So um, just through those anecdotes, we know that this number, suspect that this number is also quite um, low and not representative of the, the total number of um, students with disabilities on our population uh, or on our, our campus. And then the other thing too, is that these um, numbers like the psychological disabilities having 911, um, these categories are primary disability types. So each of these numbers represent unique students um, and don't account for the fact that there are students that identify with multiple disabilities. So a student that might have a mobility disability, but is also um, diagnosed with ADD or ADHD, right? So just remember as well that um, that these are unique students, but each of these 911 students with psychological disabilities may also have other disabilities that are not accounted for in these numbers. Um, all right, so moving on um, to just discuss some of the recent trends that we've observed. Um, so we've had a growing request for flexibility with attendance and deadlines. So students that for whatever reason, um, usually this accommodation is provided for students that uh, experience flare ups, they have a disability that um, is marked by um, episodes of um, uh, a flare up that might mean that they need a little bit more time to uh, get an assignment completed, or maybe they not they might not be able to make it to class that day. Um, we've seen, especially coming back from COVID and a long period of remote learning, we've seen a request to increase remote learning as a, as a reasonable accommodation um, and coming from, um, from students that want to remain remote um, to finish their learning. And then we've also seen an increase in requests for single room and university housing. So students that don't want a roommate, can't have a roommate because of a disability um, living here on campus. And then technology needs, which this is related to remote learning, which um, Roberto will get into um, next, um, an, an increased need for tablets and mics um, so that we can set up remote learning successfully if that's determined to be a reasonable accommodation through the interactive process. Um, and then also uh, an increase in need for Zoom enabled classrooms, which I know that um, over the past couple of years, there have been more Zoom enabled classrooms built or technology added in order to better um, enable that um, a hybrid structure for either having a meeting or teaching a class or whatever it might be. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Roberto. Hello, everyone. I'm Roberto Santiago. I'm the Associate Director for the DPRC. Started here at SF State in November of 2021. Um, my background, my doctoral work is in pedagogy. So I started in higher ed as an interpreter and then was in the classroom for several years as an instructor uh, before moving into student services. So that's sort of the, the lens and the framework that I bring to this discussion is that of someone who's been where you all are and stood up in front of a class day after day and, and done this work. Um, so hopefully that helps, uh, you know, bring that message forward. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some best practices for course accessibility and flexibility. Um, as Nicole said, we are seeing a lot of requests or growing requests for remote learning for a variety of reasons. Um, and there's some understandable pushback from instructors on having you know sort of this one hybrid or high flex student in a class. So the first thing that I would say is, <laughs> Don't worry that the technology is going to be a barrier. Generally, when you're talking about having uh, remote learning for one student, they're still going to join your class. Our goal is to still have them join your class synchronously. Um, if that, if you're having a synchronous class, even if that's an in-person class, um, and we usually do that using a lapel mic, um, a tablet where your student is housed, right, um, and Zoom, and the way that that works is, you know, the student sort of is in the tablet and if they have to do small group work in the class or talk with someone one-on-one, -on -one, you can just take that tablet and move it over to the table and hand the rest of the group the mic. Um, and it's it's worked 
really well this semester, and it's something that I've done previously in my own classes. Um, a couple of other best practices, specifically when you have students who aren't able to look at the visual at the same time that you're talking. So this could be a blind or low vision student. It could be a deaf or hard of hearing student using an interpreter. Um, it could be a hard of hearing student who has to watch captioning um, and, and probably others. Um, but there's two things that are really helpful in sort of creating general accessibility for your class. And one uh, is describing what you're doing. And the TAP is short for a thinking aloud protocol, um, which is essentially what you're doing here um, is especially in a class where you're demonstrating something, right? So maybe you have something up on the screen, you're teaching students how to use maybe even just get around your Canvas page if they've never seen Canvas before. But the idea is to avoid words that you think are going with your visual, right? So instead of saying, so you're going to click on this over here, and then you're going to click on that, right? If a student can't watch the screen at the same time, so if they have to watch an interpreter, or if they're blind or low vision, that those words aren't going to help. So what you want to really do is talk your talk through what you're doing using more descriptive language, right? I'm going to go to the upper left hand corner, I'm going to click on the link that says, uh, I don't know, menu, there's going to be a drop down, I'm picking the third option that says settings. That's a lot more useful. Another way to approach this is to describe, show, and explain. So this is the old uh, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them, right? So describe what you're going to do, but don't do it. Just describe it. Then just do it and don't talk. Then tell them what you did, right? So you can sort of imagine how that maps to the previous example. Um, another great thing to do in class is if you give people time for an activity, don't then talk your way through the activity because if you're in a situation with an interpreter, the interpreter is going to have to choose whether to interpret what you're saying or interpret for the group. Or if the student is supposed to be doing their worksheet, does the interpreter interrupt that time to say what you're saying, but then they're taking away time from doing the activity. So it's really best if you're working uh, with deaf and hard of hearing students to, if you're giving them time to the activity, give them that time. And if there's something you want to tell specific students, you can walk around the room and do that. But know that those general sort of chat as they're doing it, things are less helpful for deaf and hard of hearing students. Um, some other general tips in the classroom. It's a good idea if possible to not limit technology use. And we're really not seeing this as much anymore where student, where teachers say, well, you can't have your phone out or you can't have your laptop. Um, and the reason for this is if we approve use of technology for a student or if a student has to use technology to access the message, uh, you're kind of put in a position where if someone says, well, how come, how come Bob gets to use a computer? Now you have to come up with your like vague answer without disclosing that Bob has it as an accommodation. Um, make sure that you allow interpreters space near the board, near the screen, the ability to move around the room if you're moving around the room. Um, sometimes interpreters have to sit or stand in places where you might not normally have people so that the student can see, you know, the interpreter and what's going on. I would say, uh, in my experience at SF State, the most interesting one was me moving around a table with a cadaver on it so that I could be in position for the instructor to be able to point at all the stuff they were seeing inside the inside the cadaver. Um, but you don't want to, you know, tell the interpreter, well, you got to sit in this one chair, you got to be in this one place, because that may not provide enough access to the message. Um, and remember that real-time captioning is not note-taking, right? So if you have students who have note-takers, uh, notes are great because, you know, you get like a page out of a lecture, a couple pages out of a lecture, whereas real-time captioning is a verbatim transcript of everything that was said, and it's not very helpful. Plus, uh, captioners uh, are a lot harder to get. So we don't just sort of throw captioners out there in place of note-taking. We can go to the next slide. Um, a little bit more on this, um, try to build in multiple types of particip participation and activities in your course where you can. And this relates to some of those hidden disabilities that Nicole mentioned earlier, where, um, you know, students, some students, because of their disability, may not be able to participate 
in every single way. So if your class participation only relies on people raising their hand or being called on to speak in class, that may not work for some students and could disadvantage them. Um, so having multiple activities or ways of judging participation can be small groups, uh, short writing responses, uh, as, or like an entrance or exit ticket, um, or having reflection and planned response. So there are some students who really maybe because of anxiety or something else, calling on them when they're not expecting it is not going to be the way to go. And so if you have some planned response activities, then students will sort of know like what their order is, like putting names on a board in the, the uh, order that they're going to report out or something like that can help to relieve some of that. Um, and then when we come to something like flex flexibility and attendance and deadlines or remote learning, those types of accommodations, um, a lot of the immediate sort of anxiety or pushback from an instructor is, well, this is an in-person class or we do a lot of interactive activities. And yes, that's great. Remember that how you teach isn't the same as what you teach. And so what you actually can and can't do in a classroom, from our perspective, is more bound by your syllabus and your SLOs than it is by sort of the way that you've been teaching it or the way that you have planned to teach it. Um, we find that most SLOs can be met remotely. Uh, the Notable sort of obvious exceptions are like lab classes where you have to be doing titrations or using specific equipment that isn't available at home. Um, so what we really ask is when we first come to you and say, hey, we'd like to talk to you about remote attendance, um, keep an open mind. And in general, when you're developing your class activities before the semester starts, start to think about like, how would I do this if I suddenly had a remote student? Or, you know, if this is how the, my testing goes and I like to have tests at the beginning of class or, you know, how do I think about when I'm going to have a student in a testing center with time and a half, right? And just sort of have that flexibility and that plasticity within your lesson planning. Um, and remember that we're here to help, right? So we're not just going to put these requirements on you for an accommodation without also trying to provide some tools for you to be able to, to carry that out. And we can't do everything for you. Um, it is the responsibility of each instructor to make sure courses are accessible. And of course, you know, universal design for learning, doing that at the very beginning is always easier than trying to retrofit an accommodation to your class. So as you're developing new materials, making sure they're accessible is gonna save you a lot of time later. Um, but we're here to consult. Um, I'm happy to sit down with you and meet with you and look at some of your activities and talk about how they can be adapted or look at your SLOs and think about how else they can be met uh, outside of what you may already have planned. Um, and we can also do some in-class consultation and support. So I've been known to run out and set up tablets and microphones and things for people. Um, we're not gonna do that ongoing, right? So if recorded lectures is something that, you know, we need to have a video recording. We're going to help you figure out how to do that, but I'm not actually going to come and set up a video camera and break it down for you every time. Um, but we will absolutely figure out like the most efficient and uh, instructor friendly way to get these things done. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out and contact us or me if you have more questions. And I think that's it for my part. Oh, no, wait, one more little bit, sorry. Uh, where we've identified some support and training needs and things that maybe, you know, people can get from CEDL or partly from us or from other resources, um, Zoom. It's really interesting. We have a lot of people, even after spending whatever, two years almost exclusively on Zoom, um, a lot of people are still not fully up to speed on how to really use all of Zoom's functions. So uh, specifically the accessibility features, things like being able to enable auto transcription, um, giving participants the ability to multi-pin, which becomes important when you're working with interpreters because you know how like the tiles will jump around. You don't want a deaf person trying to search for their interpreter every 15 seconds. So giving that student the ability to multi-pin and keep their interpreter static can be really helpful. Um, alternatively, of course, I get a phone call right now. No problem. Um, alternatively, uh, you can spotlight or give the interpreters the ability to spotlight themselves in each other, which also will help keep that tile static. Um, and then 
If you haven't yet had a chance to work in a Zoom enabled classroom, maybe get a tutorial, see how they work. Um, when you have remote and in-class participants, sometimes if people don't have their assemble themselves muted the right way, you can get echoes and things like that. Um, so just kind of play around, learn how to avoid that. And then remember to specifically engage your Zoom participants. Um, so that's one. I started teaching like what I call sort of true hybrid classes, I think in 2013. And I had half my students on Fuse back then and half my students in the room. And one of the challenges was to remember to specifically say, all right, uh, remote students, do you all have anything, right? Because the conversation can get going in the room and you want to make sure that you uh, sort of be mindful of specifically engaging your remote participants. And that really is the end of my time. Thank you, Roberto. Hi, everybody. My name is Maysoon Algethi. Um, I started at DPRC in 2016 as a disability specialist um, and transitioned to the lead in about, I think it was summer of 2021. Um, and so what I will be focusing on is primarily some student success stories. Um, I will share stories that are primarily focused on remote learning. Um, I will share a story, a disability specialist perspective, and then a story from a student's perspective. Um, so let me start with um, a student experience from a disability specialist perspective. So this is um, one of my colleagues um, who had um, a student had come to DPRC to request remote, remote learning as an accommodation. And the specialist and the associate director, Roberto, um, collaborated. And part of that collaboration also was um, meeting with each professor for each course to determine um, if the request was reasonable. And then, you know, that just required multiple um, meetings or conversations, brainstorming um, to determine what would be needed to make this um, accommodation happen. Um, examples like Roberto shared earlier is determining whether or not the physical classroom was a smart room or if technology was needed. Um, and so for one example I'm going to share is um, this one class for this student in person required some group engagement and interactions. Um, so it's with multiple students in the classroom. And then on the other end, it's like one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so Roberto and the specialist were able to work with the professor um, and to brainstorm how this could work for the student to engage in, in these activities remotely. Um, and what they did was, as Roberto shared earlier, an iPad was offered to the professor to allow the student to engage and participate in group, in-person group activities and one-on-ones. Um, as Roberto mentioned earlier, the idea was to have the student who's um, at home log in and the professor would be able to physically assign, place the iPad to a student group or one-on-one, -on -one, which I thought was awesome. That's why we have an awesome team here. We all work together to think outside the box. Um, so the next success story I'm going to share is from one of my students who um, graciously wrote something for me to share. So I'm going. I'm going to read. It is anonymous. Um, I want to respect their uh, privacy. So this is also an example from the student being supported virtually for an in-person class. Um, this classroom for this course was already set up to create or offer virtual, so it was a smart room. Um, so the professor was um, willing to meet with me and the student to create some um, ideas around how to accommodate the student. So the, my student shares, when the professor does the in-person lectures, they hook up their laptop, which allows the teacher to show a Google slide presentation to the class in the room and to me through Zoom. The professor checks to make sure I can hear them and see the presentation. 
The professor shares all their presentations on iLearn as well as with photos of anything written on the whiteboard in class and links to all the resources. The Zoom is connected so that I can hear the professor and the class. I can hear the lecture, the questions asked by the students, and I can participate by asking questions and commenting. I also get to experience the general mood of the classroom, which has been fun. There is an activity portion of the class and I was able to participate in the activity portion entirely virtually. This was a meaningful contribution to the class. I feel very met with my accommodations in this class. I feel like I'm learning and participating equitably, sorry, equitably. I feel like I have a relationship with the professor even though I don't see them face to face. I feel included and I feel like I am contributing. I am thankful to have the opportunity to be accommodated for a necessary major course so that I can stay safe while accomplishing my academic goals and enjoying the experience. I hope that SFSU will offer more virtual class options overall because so many of my disability needs have been inherently met by attending online classes, being not only disabled, but immune compromised during a pandemic has shown me that there is an opportunity to change systems, to be more inclusive and more offer more options. Thank you, next slide. So next one I'm gonna briefly talk about is um, what students need from faculty. So moving forward, um, it, it's, it's really great. I've worked with a lot of faculty who have just been really um, open and available to me and kind of just explore options. And some of, some of these are from students that I've worked with and other specialists, like what has helped them um, and what faculty have done to help them succeed. So recording Zoom lectures um, allows students who have been approved for audio recording or note-taking express, which is another type of uh, note-taking support, removing barriers to accessing a recording on their own because part of what these students really need to be doing if they're approved for um, audio recording, it's the student who has the accommodations responsibility to get a recorder and record. And so if the professor's allowing all students to record Zoom lectures or the professor is recording it, then it can remove that piece for the student and it's creating universal design. Um, some of these were mentioned earlier, so I'm just gonna briefly go over them. Um, enabling Zoom transcription, media captioning, and this is not only for live Zoom recordings, but it's also as asynchronous courses. Um, it's really important that students um, have the ability to have media captioning and we, Daniel Fontaine is going to speak next. So he might be able to say more about that. Um, but also we are here, um, as the lead disability specialist, um, I consult quite a bit with faculty and just helping them kind of identify some barriers or implementing accommodations. Um, and part of, you know, part of that is bringing in, um, the associate director, possibly, um, the lead accessible technology uh, service coordinator. Um, but once again, as Roberto stated earlier, it's really important to just be flexible and open and creating solutions. Um, please don't say no until like we can work together to really identify whether a request is reasonable or an accommodation is reasonable. Or if you want to support a student additionally, you know, um, beyond the accommodation, which we always appreciate faculties doing that and you need some someone to brainstorm with, please reach out to me or our program. So for me. All right, it's my turn. Um, my name is Daniel Fontaine and I'm the, uh, the lead accessible technology services coordinator. I've been here uh, about 10 years. I'm overall responsible for, uh, as Nicole said, Media accessibility, uh, hard work, tech, hard work accessibility. Uh, I also oversee uh, accessible procurement of uh, technology on campus, as well as a uh, web accessibility. So we have a pretty broad uh, technology uh, umbrella that we work with here. So 
Um, I'll be covering a bit of a hodgepodge of different topics related to accessible, accessible media. Um, to start, I thought I'd provide a fairly detailed side-by-side -side comparison between the DPRC's accommodation model uh, and uni universal design for learning. Um, as a disability technologist, I work primarily within the accommodations model day to day. Uh, well, say CEDL and by extension, much of the zeitgeist around media accessibility is focused on UDL. Uh, so when you communicate with me and my program, we'll probably be um, promoting particular solutions for particular students based on what they need and within the accommodations frame. Uh, you know, we, we try our best to just make it happen with individual student requests. So to start, um, Disability Accommodations focuses on providing individualized, tailored support to students with disabilities, addressing their specific needs and barriers. Uh, this reactive approach is provided upon request and is based on collaboration among experts, educators, and students. Uh, the accommodations are guided by legal frameworks, such as the uh, ADA and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Uh, so ensuring legal compliance and, and case by case, for case by case uh, accommodations. Uh, the history here with accommodation dates back to the civil rights movement in the 1960s and 70s, uh, which led to the enactment of Section 504 on 70, and the Rehabilitation Act in 73, uh, and marked the beginning of a more inclusive approach to education for individuals with disabilities. Um, in contrast, UDL uh, is a proactive and inclusive educational design approach that aims to accommodate uh, a diverse set of learning needs for students. Uh, UDL emphasizes three uh, key principles, multiple means of representation, expression, and engagement, uh, by providing a variety of ways to access, process, and demonstrate knowledge. Uh, uh, UDL fosters an inclusive learning environment. Uh, UDL is uh, actually dates back into the 90s, uh, since actually inspired by uh, universal design and architecture and product development. Um, so uh, this uh, UDL comes from the Center for Applied Special Technology, CAS, uh, and has been in, they have been instrumental in developing, promoting the UDL framework. Um, UDL is also supported by other legal frameworks, such as the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, uh, and uh, the WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which uh, we work with extensively here at the DPRC for um, uh, web accessibility. Um, so these frameworks uh, promote inclusive design principles and best practices, ensuring that uh, learning materials and environments are accessible getting to everyone. Um, next slide. So um, moving into uh, a bit more personal uh, and uh, issues related to uh, our program, I wanted to go over uh, what the sort of the accessible media production um, timeline has looked like over the past decade or so and, and what we have coming for us in the next few years. Um, what you uh, see here is uh, an indication of uh, the way COVID and remote instructions have changed the way we all work, which affects everyone here, and it's accessible media production has actually been no different. Um, so it's been greatly affected since 2020. Um, if you could look at the graph, you'll see we peaked around 2016, and when COVID hit, uh, our, our production numbers dropped pretty pretty uh, starkly. Uh, so by 2020, we're a third of where we were um, in the mid, mid aughts. So just to finish, accessible media production here involves converting textbooks. This is primarily one of the biggest things we do. We convert textbooks to accessible forms like PDF and audio. And we also scrape um, or integrate into your uh, iLearning Canvas courses for content like PDFs and readings. And we prepare those in accessible forms for students. So this graph shows each semester's accessible media production count of textbooks starting in 2005. You can see that our digital accessible media production peaked in 2016 and the 2010s was a deeply transitional moment here where we saw document access become mostly digital. Prior to that, there was a lot more paperwork. And during this uh, decade, things have rapidly shifted to be fully digital. Uh, and one of our primary jobs here is to uh, convert to analog content into digital content. So likely it would be a, a drop off. Um, but by the time COVID happened, uh, much of the technology to enable full digital access was already in place. So COVID uh, being a watershed moment uh, likely pushed many into using purely digital forms of media. So um, my guess is that uh, our traditional production, uh, accessible media production will not return to where it was. Uh, there are a few expectations that uh, I've you know, been thinking about for why this has happened. 
Um, the first, obviously, is remote learning. Uh, the rapid shift to remote and online learning may have resulted in a decrease in the need for certain accommodations as students could access course materials uh, and attend classes from the comfort of their homes, uh, limiting some of the physical barriers. Uh, there's probably an increased, uh, increased uh, 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 use of, you, increased using of accessible technology. So it's likely many, you, through UDL, many instruction students have adopted uh, accessible technologies and digital tools during the shift to remote learning on their own and in, inadvertently implementing UDL practices and principles in their daily life, which would reduce the accommodations load. Um, there may also be reduced awareness in the services being remote. So the transition to remote learning may have made it more difficult for students with disabilities to be aware of the accessible media accommodations available to them. So that's something we need to explore and work on to see if that's the case. Um, and um, again, instructors corrupt approach. I know everyone I've been in a lot of communication with instructors trying to make their courses more accessible and in implementing UDL practices. And uh, it's likely that just uh, being more accessible and in, in general is, is making accommodations uh, less necessary in accessible media. Um, next slide. All right, so just some uh, some thoughts about uh, what's coming uh, in the future here. With all that being said, so uh, moving forward, our goal within uh, the DPRC Media Lab is uh, to automate as much of the production process as possible. Uh, we will still need to be able to provide the same services as before, very tailored, customized services, but just with fewer resources um, and um, that will be through integrating into Canvas and other services and outsourcing where possible. Um, and uh, we're, we're, but we're well on that, that path already. So I think we're, we're in a good shape to keep, keep providing high quality services here. But there's some interesting AI trends on the horizon, which are going to affect everyone. Accessible media is, uh, the next few years is going to dramatically change everything we do. So some interesting ideas here is um, automated and introspective image descriptions. So the idea of a static image description uh, is probably obsolete. Uh, and users will now be able to interact with an image and interrogate it for the information they need. So no more writing alt tags or uh, uh, you know, having students come up with uh, really complicated explanations for graphs. Uh, the AI will be able to do that itself, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, personalized learning experiences. Uh, it'll likely that these tools will just create courses. Uh, learning needs can be analyzed and whole courses will be constructed based on the unique needs of any student uh, disability needs included. Um, automation of disability testing. That's, there's already a lot of that, but this is it's gonna go into high gear now with some of these uh, AI language models. Uh, intelligent voice control systems. Uh, AI, something like Dragon, which we already have, which allows a user to talk to a computer. The new, these new AI systems will, will understand context. So they'll know, they'll know everything that's happening and they can take basic language cues and they'll be able to understand what you're saying rather than having to know each command. Particularly, you'll just interact with the computer like you would with a person. And then what I'm thinking here is that the individual nature of accommodations will merge with the multimodal aspect of UDL, um, where the user is simply in control of what they want to see. Um, so the idea of uh, an accommodation is no longer necessarily relevant. And then doing UDL work will be uh, will change as uh, we'll want to create content that is easily ingestible by an AI. Uh, next slide. All right, so here's the meat. Uh, some best practices moving forward while we're uh, in the next few years. We have a variety of tools uh, that are available. Um, one of them is the Accessible Media Quick Converter. And this is a really useful document conversion tool. Uh, it can create accessible PDFs, mostly accessible PDFs, not completely accessible, uh, Word files, MP3 files. Uh, we recommend this as a first line um, conversion tool for course design. Uh, if you have scanned PDFs and you want to make them you know, readable by computer, it's a great way to go. Um, go to this link, it's on our site. Uh, for a variety of captioning, we, we use uh, at the DPS, we use something called Amara, and that's an open source uh, video captioning site. So uh, videos that are not lecture capture, that are publicly available, we'll actually post on Amara. So I recommend if you're setting up a course, to just search, uh, go to this, the Amara website here, and search for the videos that it's on YouTube or Vimeo uh, that might already exist with fully professionally produced captions here. And you can just check um, and add those. 
Now in Canvas, Canvas comes with an accessibility checker built into the WYSIWYG editor. Um, so uh, run that when you're done and it'll give you tips on how to make your course page more accessible, really straightforward and easy to use. Um, that being said, all videos need captions, not just lecture capture. So um, automatic captions are still not legally appropriate to be used for any, uh, any materials here on campus. And that includes a lot of YouTube videos, they'll have captions, but um, they will be automatic and uh, we'll have to convert them anyway. So um, now we try to make that as easy as possible. The DPRC has access to your course and we'll go in and we'll pull all the video content out, we'll analyze it and we'll automatically caption it for you if a student in the class is approved for that accommodation. Um, so we, 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 we uh, every day we'll run and we'll check your course. Uh, we'll send you the videos that need to be captioned and we'll send you a web page that you can either add to your course that just has a list of all the videos you've captioned or uh, to be more in, in line with UDL, we, we prefer that you replace uh, the links on your site with the captioned version. But uh, I know everyone's busy and I am happy if you just put the DPRC's special web page that we would send you uh, with all the captioned links because it's all, it's all, uh, it all repopulates automatically, which makes it nice and easy. Uh, to be clear, iLearn video and media site captioning uh, are both managed through uh, academic technology. We approve the service, but um, the actual implementation and running of the systems is over at AT, while the DPRC is responsible for all other video media use, so DVDs, YouTube, Vimeo, whatever. That's our, that's our area. We have to make sure those are, um, have captions in your course. Um, also, we are working on a course remediation service that exists outside of the accommodations process. Uh, if you would like, I would encourage you to go to the link at the bottom and submit uh, your, we're only doing Canvas, we're no longer looking at iLearn, only doing Canvas. Please submit your course so we can gather more data and build out um, a system that will uh, give you guidance and support and remediation for documents and videos on your course. Um, next slide. Uh, the one thing, there's one thing you can do as an instructor to make our dice a little bit easier is when you're scanning uh, your documents, just make sure all the words are, very, are visible. Uh, we do uh, we spend a lot of time, uh, our student assistants spend a lot of time fixing um, images like this when we, when we pull from your course uh, to make it accessible. Um, and it's just a rule of thumb, if the uh, computer, if we can't read it, the computer can't read it and the student can't read it. Um, and so uh, please uh, just push a little harder on the, uh, the, the scanner when you're, when you're uh, getting your books. Uh, next slide. All right, uh, to close out, um, I think it's just important to raise the difference between accommodations and UDL. Uh, still legally, the accommodations process supersedes work in UDL. So while UDL needs to happen and everyone, we want everyone on board, it still may be possible for us to come to you and say there's a particular need that we need to serve. Pick your student with a particular need that we need to serve um, and please work with us to, uh, one second, I just went off. Uh, please work with us to um, make uh, this content accessible. But you know, the long run with UDL, as I think we're already seeing with our accessible media request is that things are already accessible and students just don't feel the need to raise the accommodation to begin with. Um, and that's all I have, thank you. Sorry, running two screens. Um, so just uh, quickly before we turn it over for questions, um, there's no wrong way to contact us. Uh, our front desk is pretty good at, at directing emails um, to the right person. And also we are good at that too. So um, look at our About Us, our staff page on our website. Um, all of our contact information is there. Feel free to reach out to any of us after today if you have additional questions or want to talk through some of the things that came up today one-on-one. Um, -on -one. We're happy to do that and also happy to direct you to the right person if we're not quite the right person to discuss what you would like to discuss. Um, we are open. Feel free to stop by as well in our um, our office suite in uh, SSB 110. Um, 
And uh, we also offer drop-in hours every day, both virtually and in person. Those are more for, for students uh, to meet with a disability specialist, but also uh, Maysoon will tell you that, that they do um, get faculty inquiries as well. And so that is a place for you to come as well, um, to come and ask your questions. And then we have some MyDPRC training videos available online. Um, for those of you, um, uh, hopefully most of you are aware at this point that, that faculty do have a MyDPRC portal um, as well as students. And so there are resources for you as faculty as well um, for how to use that portal to see which students in your classes have requested accommodations. Um, and again, we're happy to provide some one-on-one -on -one support with that. So um, that concludes our presentation um, and I will stop sharing my screen um, and have some, some Q&A. Thank you all so much for, for your time this afternoon. Can I, can I just mention one thing because it came up recently with the, my DPRC portals? Um, <clears throat> Sometimes the letter that we send you, the accommodation letter, will have a different name than what is on your roster because students right now can change to their preferred name in PeopleSoft, whatever we call it, my SFSU. Um, and that isn't yet always talking to our system. So when you get that accommodation letter, please try to match it up with last names as, as well as first names on your roster um, so that you're not surprised midway through the semester when the student says they haven't been accommodated. Um, Great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. No. So my name is Robin Oladort and I'm here representing academic technology as well as ATAC. Um, and I will be presenting the Q and A, um, but I just wanted to quickly remind everyone who's tuned in and will be tuned into the recording that we are recording and we'll be circulating the recording. So this conversation can keep going after this webinar. Um, so some of the questions are being answered in chat right now. Um, so we'll start with, uh, do we have any data about the success of these remote learning strategies? This question was asked, um, I think, when Maysoon was presenting and kind of relating to uh, hybrid and high flex classes. So there's a lot of data um, to indicate the classes are uh, maybe less or uh, less effective than uh, in-person classes. So they want to know what data um, we have and uh, kind of our stance on, on high flex learning. Yeah, so uh, that's an excellent question. And I think that that's a common concern is how effective remote access is um, if everybody else is in the classroom. And I wanna just be clear that we're talking about um, providing a student with remote access to an in-person class. We're not talking about changing the modality of a class or the modality in which a course is taught. Um, that's an instructional choice. Um, I know that some of that also is determined by the department, you know, what will be taught online, what will be taught high flex, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so we're specifically talking about providing an accommodation to allow a student to participate in an in-person class um, or whatever the current modality of the class is, whether that's um, you know, hybrid, whatever that looks like, um, allowing that student uh, a reasonable accommodation to participate remotely. So um, we don't have any data on that. And I will say, um, just to add something as well, a little bit of context and history for this accommodation, this is something that disabled students and the disability community was requesting a long time before COVID. And now <laughs> we can do it, right? It's been proven that we can put the whole entire university online. And I fully acknowledge and recognize that there were bumps, that there are some courses that just aren't as effective when they're taught online. Um, you know, Roberto specifically mentioned lab classes. And I also know that there's other um, highly participatory classes that might not be as effective when we're talking or when they're when they're taught online um, as opposed to in person. However, the result of COVID is showing that we um, that there is a way to do it and that we can do it successfully. And so um, we don't have any specific data right now on how effective this has been as an accommodation other than some of what Maysoon has talked about. Um, sharing that there are some positive success stories that allow students to access um, uh, the course, which gets them closer to graduation, which also, as we know, um, uh, we, right, we right now are under um, a crunch to get more students to attend our university, to retain students, to graduate students. And we also look at this as a creative way um, to provide an accommodation to allow a student um, to retain them and also to get them closer to graduation. So um, I just wanted to be clear um, 
impacts uh, on the difference between providing an accommodation for remote access and then changing the, the modality of a course, um, which is not something that we at DPRC would recommend for a, a student. Um, so we, we go the accommodation route for that. So um, wanted to clarify that. Um, great question. Um, and hopefully <laughs> in the future, once we start doing this more, we might actually be able to provide some data. But uh, this is really the first semester that we've done this um, more intentionally as an accommodation. All right, and moving on to the next question, which is, um, it has a little bit more of a practical element to it. Uh, so how do you consider classes with several group projects when accommodating students um, that have flare-ups uh, on an irregular basis? So kind of a strategy question. Uh, I'm Masoon or Roberto, do you wanna answer that one? What our approach might be? I can start and Roberto, could you chime in? So I, I have had faculty reach out and I do a lot of, um, I, I have meetings with a lot of faculty to understand their, you know, SLOs and, and the idea behind these group activities. So a lot of it is case by case, and I wouldn't really be able to answer that. It, it really is spending time with each faculty around the SLOs to kind of create some outside the box thinking and solutions. But Roberto has experience with teaching, so maybe he can provide some examples or I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you you did a really good job answering that. Uh, I concur. The, the first thing that I want to see when someone asks a question like that isn't the what you do, it's why do you do it and what are you trying to achieve? Right. So you, maybe you have a lot of group activities. Why do you have the group activities? Is the group being in the group essential to the SLO or is that just the delivery method that you chose and you like it and you feel like it's effective and and that's great? Um, but is it the only way to, to achieve this SLO? So that's where everything really starts is looking at what are we trying to achieve? Um, I would also offer that there's so many asynchronous and synchronous and remote collaboration tools now out in the world that missing a class, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't meet with your group, talk to your group, work on the Google Doc, contribute to the slides, um, film your piece of the video. Like there's so much we can do now. Almost every class seems to have a Discord server. Students are in touch with each other. Um, so I wouldn't see someone who has, say, flexibility with attendance and deadlines necessarily being unable to participate if they have a flare-up. I think that, again, we would start looking at what are some alternative forms of participation. 